Hey everyone, what's up? Welcome to another episode of FE Cast, the official podcast of Friends of Eternal. I am your host, Sunnyvale, and today is just going to be a little mini episode. I'm actually going to be doing this cast on my own. I wanted to have Ruark join me for the cast, but he's unfortunately busy, what with reveling in his glorious victory and getting married next week. So congratulations to Ruark. More on that in a bit. But let me just go into the show overview today. We're mostly going to be talking about news items that happened in the past week and the results of big tournaments will start off with draft masters and the ets then we'll be talking about ranked masters which is coming this upcoming weekend and i'll be giving a rundown of what i expect the metagame to be like and what decks that i think are going to be good choices for the event i'll also be giving a short rundown on the friends of eternal twitch channel's first week of existence and finally i'll be finishing off the show with science not having it where i'll be talking about a card that received a lot of hype but i'm not quite sold on and if you've been paying attention to me in the discord and or this show you might have an idea of what card i'm not sold on even though a lot of people have been hyped about it all right let's get into it first off draft masters this past weekend was won by ruark we have another friend going to the eternal world championships joining collector avion and no verb so congratulations ruark ruark's also getting married next week so congratulations friend if you want to check out the deck list that ruark used in order to seal the deal this past weekend go to the friends of eternal twitter and there will be an image of, of the winning deck while ruark was the big winner this weekend i'd also like to give a big congratulations to man and mouse who took down the entrance exam which had over 2,000 people and if you don't know who man and mouse is and you don't know about his drafting well he streams frequently and is, is very good, and it, it was great to see someone who's put that much effort in drafting Eternal get a victory, even if the tournament wasn't worth a ton, it was just worth bragging rights, it was great to see Man Mouse take it down. And before I go any further, I'd just like to plug the Draft Summit panel that I did with Man and Mouse and Caleb last week, last Thursday. If you haven't seen this already, I highly recommend checking it out. It is two hours of fantastic information from myself and two of the drafters that I consider to be the best in the game about Dark Frontier and what we think of the format and all the advice we want to give to people to help them succeed in the format. So go check it out. I'll post a link to it if you're just listening to this. You can also check it out in the Friends of Eternal Discord if you go to the draft channel and you look under pinned messages, there will be a link to the YouTube video of that draft panel. All right, let's talk a little bit about the format of these drafts. Event. Now, I, for one, am absolutely thrilled that we're finally having some competitive limited tournaments, but I'm really not a fan of the way that the tournament structure is. So for entrance exam, the structure was everyone plays 10 games and then cut to top 16, and then those 16 play an asynchronous draft in order to battle it out. And the way this worked is everyone drafted like they were just clicking on the draft button from the homepage of Eternal, and there was a 16-person bracket in order to determine the winner of the tournament. Now, for Draft Masters, it was a little better. It was 12 games of 8-pack sealed to determine the top 64 with some tiebreakers, and then the top 64 were grouped into 8-person pods, and each of those 8-person pods had their own draft and bracket, but it was still asynchronous, and then the winners of each of those 8 pods went on to form a final pod or bracket of 8 people where they all did another draft and battled it out again. I don't know if we were promised asynchronous draft. I want to say we were because that was definitely my impression going into this this week and these two tournaments. And the fact that the drafts were just the normal draft format really bums me out. And I have to say I'm a little disappointed because I don't think it makes for a fantastic competitive experience. I, I could be wrong when I say this, but I think that a lot of the times when you're in drafts in when you're drafting in pods such as in magic where you have an eight person pod and then those people play each other well there are drafts where everyone's deck is good and then there are drafts where everyone's decks are bad some pods just end up in a train wreck where people aren't able to read signals very clearly and then people are jumping all over the place as to to what colors they they end up taking and nobody really ends up with a good deck and then they have to battle it out with whatever they can make do in eternal 
Returnal or any game where you have asynchronous draft, this isn't the case because for one, there's no hate drafting. You don't have to worry about playing against one of the cards that you're passing. And for another, different people may be in drafts of different levels of train wreck. For example, if I'm not drafting with the person that I play against in round one, maybe they were in a draft that went really smoothly. Everyone read their signals perfectly. And so that everyone that was part of a draft got a really good deck out of that draft. But if I was part of a deck that really train wrecked, then I'm going to just be at a gigantic disadvantage. And that, now I don't know that this whole concept is necessarily true, but I, I really feel like it is the case. There have been a lot of times where I've picked up a good deck, but that's only because I'm passing really strong cards and sending really clear signals to the person next to me. And it works out well for me, yes, but it also works out really well for the person that I'm passing to. This also this actually came up <laughs> at, at the Pro Tour that I played at. During Mythic Championship 1, I was passing to Dmitry Budakov and I had an inkling that a color was open. I forget exactly what color it was. It was probably black or white. I remember I had a black white deck and I opened up one of the biggest red bombs in the format, but I had an idea that the person to my left, Dimitri, was in a red deck and that if I picked up this red bomb, I wasn't going to get passed or paid off anything in the in the final pack. So I ended up passing this gigantic red bomb and subsequent powerful red cards to this person that who I ended up playing against and it served my deck well because I ended up with a really strong deck but I also played against Budakov and got absolutely destroyed to nobody's surprise. So that was a bit of a long ta tangent but I think that that type of drafting experience is much more compelling to me than this asynchronous draft where you're not playing against the actual people that you're drafting. Weird things happen in these types of drafts and I feel like it may be an illusion but I feel like you don't have as much agency over over your fate because your actions have nothing to do with the power levels of other people's deck. Anyway, I'm really curious what everyone else thinks about this, so please feel free to send me a message or tweet at me with regards to synchronous versus asynchronous drafting. Well, like I said, I think that synchronous drafting would be really cool. I know that it's pr there's probably the software for it hasn't quite been finished yet or, or something like that. They probably want to have synchronous drafting for these big tournaments, and it's just not ready yet, but that is something that I'd really like to see, and I was a little disappointed that we didn't get to see that this weekend. As it stood, the format was pretty miserable. If you've played the first week of a sealed league, you know how much variance there is in how good your pool is. I mean, you can have an 8-pack sealed deck that is just absolute garbage. There's nothing you can do about it. Whereas, if you happen to open a lot of cards in the same factions, then you can have a really powerful deck and just mow people down. So, I, I think that 8-pack sealed is just, like, not a fantastic format for these really competitive tournaments. And and 12 games certainly isn't enough if we're going to be playing a format like 8-pack sealed. I would like to see either way more games or preferably some sort of format, maybe, I mean, if we could just get like everyone in synchronous drafts with each other for the whole tournament, that would be really cool. And for, for like Magic GPs, you, you play sealed on day one, but that's also part of the limitation of not setting up however many draft pods. Like, in a Magic GP, you have to have all the table settings and all of the pre-stamped product and then all of the pauses and breaks and registering and all the nonsense that you have to do in order to have draft pods be your format for everyone. But in internal, I feel like the those limitations are probably mitigated by the fact that it's digital. Like, sure, you're going to have some people that have buys, but overall, I feel like you could get it such that such that everyone's in synchronous drafts with other people, and then you have those people play each other. I guess this also would have the problem of you'd have to wait for those people to finish their games before playing them, so maybe this isn't such a great idea. Okay, I think I've convinced myself that this is not the experience that we want for competitive <laughs> internal, because one of the great things about competitive eternal of course is that you get to play your games at your own pace and you're not locked into you know waiting a certain amount of time between games and whatnot anyway i digress congratulations double congratulations to ruark congratulations to man and mouse much deserved victory and yeah we'll see ruark in world which should happen soon we also don't have a ton of information on worlds but but it's going to be really exciting when it does. okay let's talk about the ets the ets was win by Tobo from Eternal Titans playing Huru Flyers with Siddhiti. Now, I don't think it's a huge surprise. Siddhiti is showing off to be an extremely powerful card and showing up in a lot of different strategies. The runners up to the tournament, including
included Combray and Rakana versions of Saditi decks, but I kind of feel like this Shuru version is just the best version of these Saditi decks. You get access to Palace, which with flyers is extremely, extremely powerful, and you just have the insignias you need in order to place a DT time. One of the innovations we saw in Tobo's list is the inclusion of Poaching Drake. Now Poaching Drake is not a card that's seen a ton of tournament play. It's a four cost, four three flyer that says summon, transform a unit with cost three or less to a two one goat. The target that springs to mind immediately for me is Champion of Chaos. I don't know if this is exactly what Tobo is trying to target, but Champion of Chaos seems like the biggest, baddest three drop that we've seen an uptick in with Stone Scar coming back. The other card that, or I, I should say cards, that I could see this really targeting are Valkyrie Enforcer and True Pacifier, both from the Huru decks, and, and it seems like a pretty good way of gaining an edge. So props to Tobo and ET for coming up with this tech. I think if you expect a lot of Huru mirrors in Ranked Masters next week, playing Poaching Drake in your Huru deck seems like a pretty good idea because it seems like a pretty good way of gaining an edge in the mirror. All right, I know we don't have a ton to go off of, but we do have Ranked Masters coming up next week, and that's going to be the first big tournament with the new set, Dark Frontier. We've had a couple of ETSs, and those are those are fairly competitive tournaments, but this has much more on the line. As always, with new formats, it's a pretty wide open field as to what is going to be, or rather what decks you're going to end up facing and what's going to be popular and whatnot. Because of the lack of results, people don't really have a great idea of what is at the top of the tier list or, or what's the, what the most powerful strategies are. They just have limited testing results, mostly based on their own experience. So I think it's pretty unclear as to what the metagame is going to look like for Ranked Masters coming up. So Team Rankstar did a tier list, which I'll link to in the description of this. If you are just listening at home and want to find this, you can go to the Team Rankstar website. It's Meta Monday, written up by Isochron, and it's a collection of data from many, many games played. I think the number was over 700 on what the decks they were facing. I don't think it takes into account win rate, but it's just the frequency at which decks are appearing, and here are the tiers that we have. We have in tier 1, appearing most frequently, Huru, Control, and Stone Scar. Tier 1.5 is Skycrag, Aggro, Praxis, and Film. And tier 2 is Huru, Midrange, and Rakano, Aggro. Now a few things that I want to point out. If there wasn't a new set released, I don't think we'd be too surprised at the results of this tier list. Based on the last ECQ, Stone Scar did very well, Huru was a pretty popular deck and Praxis obviously was everywhere although people if people are playing a lot of Stone Scar that I think that is one of the decks that has a good matchup against Praxis so shoving it down a tier isn't too surprising. I suppose Felm got a lot better with the inclusion of the smuggler in those factions, the 1-4. So that's why we see Feln so high, and Skycrag Aggro has seen a bit of a resurgence with the addition of Oni Patrol, and the mage that draws you a card when you have Onslaught, but you have to you have to play it that turn. So my opinion on this is that I wonder if Skycrag Aggro is just a little overrepresented because we haven't had a good aggro deck. And this one seems viable, though I'm not sold that it is really a fantastic choice for the tournament, but people are going to play aggro in tournaments, and I think that if you're playing this weekend, you should probably be prepared for Skycrag aggro. In any case, I don't think it's necessarily the best choice of for this weekend. Stone Scar with the addition of the Insignia, I think is a very strong choice. It got those buffs in Champion of Chaos and Argentport Instigator, and based on Manu's tournament win winning build, we have a good version to work off of, and I think that, I mean, any deck list coming from Manu is going to be worked on extensively, and so it's a, it's a very good build of Stone Scar that people can use and get a lot of success with. I also think that Praxis is still very good. It may not be as ubiquitous or as oppressive as it was, especially because people are starting to play Stone Scar. But I think that Praxis is just still fantastic and would be a good choice this weekend. I'm not going to go as far as to say it's the deck to beat. I think Stone Scar is probably the deck to beat, or Huru Midrange, like the deck that Tobo used to win the ETS. But I, I think that Praxis is a good deck, and I think it has pretty good matchups against just about anything. Anyway, I mentioned Huru Midrange or Huru Flyers. I mean, the deck plays Saditi 
which is arguably the best card in the new set, and Palace, which was arguably the best card in the campaign, so it's pretty hard to go wrong with that one. So I would expect the three big decks that you'd face off against this weekend to be Stone Scar Praxis and Hero Midrange, and I think all three have merits for playing. So the tier one deck that I did not recommend is Huru Control, and I, I, I don't think that Huru Control is in that great of a spot. I think you're a pretty big dog to Praxis, and any deck that plays Saditi, and let's face it, there's going to be a lot of Saditi's. If they can get the Onslaught off and, and curse you with Saditi, you're in for a lot of trouble because it's going to be difficult to prevent your opponent from drawing a card every turn. So I'm not too big on Huru Control. I don't think it's a great choice for this weekend. I would go with Stone Scar, Praxis, or Huru Midrain. Not sold on Skycrack Aggro. I think Felm could be fine, but I don't see huge incentives to play Felm that have cropped up with the release of the new set. I suppose you get the Insignia, which really helps champion the cunning, but I don't really feel like that was what was holding the deck back. It was just overall clunk and lack of a good sweeper for large units, I think was an issue for it. And of course, be prepared for aggro decks. Those are going to pop up, but I don't think that that's really a great choice for this weekend. One other note I'd like to add before we move on from here is that I've seen the Hru Flyers mirror and it looks miserable. I mean, the first person to land an onslaughted Saditi looks like they're in a, an insane position. Also, if you can get Palace before your opponent, that's a huge deal. It just does not look particularly fun. But I mean, on the other hand, neither does the Praxis mirror. Overall, given these archetypes, I mean, Praxis and Stone Scar got upgrades and insignias, and I think that's a big part of why we're seeing these decks do well is because their power base is better. Huru got the insignia, but they also got Ice Bolt and Saditi, so I guess you could say they got some real upgrades, but it's not like we're seeing a huge effect of Dark Frontier. The Reweave decks and the Weapon Reanimator deck that we were talking about last week have kind of fallen off the map. I don't know if it's just really poorly positioned or really teched against in that Noblade is very powerful against the strategy, but that one kind of fell flat on its face. And I mean, maybe it'll come back and dominate this weekend, but it's interesting to note that that deck really hasn't accomplished as much as perhaps we were expecting it. Based on my limited experiences with it, it did feel rather inconsistent and easy to beat with cards like Noblade, but even so, I, I felt like a tune version would make some noise. Eh, like I said, we will see after this weekend what comes out on top. As for myself, I'm probably going to end up on Praxis. I have a ton of experience with it. I think it has a fighting chance against everything, and its average draws are just really strong, so I might just be on Praxis. All right, that's all I have to say about Constructed and the Ranked Masters tournament coming up. If you're competing, good luck. I will be battling it out for one of the last two shots at Worlds, so I have high hopes for the weekend. All right, let's talk about the shared Friends of Eternal Twitch channel where members of FE can stream and hang out and see who else is on. And I think this first week was really a success. We only had three streams. I streamed on Tuesday, Sean DK streamed on Wednesday, and Cam Milk streamed on Saturday. I was there for Sean DK's and Cam Milk streams, and it was a lot of fun just hanging out. You can view the calendar if you go into the channel, twitch.tv slash friends of eternal and type exclamation point calendar, you can see who's going to be going live in the near future, or it's also pinned in the discord channel under streaming. There's all the information for the Friends of Eternal Twitch channel there. And it was really cool just to check out other people on the team's stream and what they were up to in the game and just hang out with the same people, even though someone you might be streaming each time. So make sure you give twitch.tv slash Friends of Eternal a follow and hopefully I'll see you in chat, whether as a broadcaster or a fellow viewer for one of our teammates. Okay, on to the final segment for today. Sunny's not having it. As I teased before earlier in the episode, there's a card that has been pretty well hyped up as being one of the big impactful cards in the new set, and I am not quite convinced. As many of you have probably guessed, I'm talking about Ross, the Walking Glacier. This is the quintuple primal card for five. It has warp, it's a 7-7 overwhelm, and it says, when it dies, shift. So the appeal to this card is pretty easy to see. You have a big overstatted unit that has warp that's really difficult to get rid of. 
It's difficult to play because it requires quintuple primal, but once it's on the board, the idea is that it's going to be a large threat, hit really hard, and be resilient to remove. And as an added bonus, when it comes off of shift, it gets unblockable for the turn, so you can guarantee that 7 damage. And I'm here to tell you why I don't think that a card like this is going to make a big impact in constructed play. So to begin with, the 5 drop slot has a lot of really heavy headers that just aren't seeing play. Some cards, for example, are Surso, Umbran Reaper, World Bear, Jotun Feast Caller, and Emily, all of which only see fringe play nowadays, but when you look at the card or you evaluate it, it's very easy to see why these cards are extremely powerful. There's the cycle from set 2 that just had a bunch of cards that generate more and more value each turn you attack with them, such as Yoden Feast Caller, Amelia, or World Bear. There are cards like Alhead that have an absurd Inspire effect, in addition to being a very well-statted unit on its own. And there are cards like Cerso that absolute dominate combat, and yet none of these cards really have a big presence in Construct. One card that probably sees more play than any of these in Constructed is Throne Warden. It's smaller than all of these units, and it doesn't generate value the way that some of them, but it still sees a fair amount of play because, because of two main reasons. Well, I don't know, maybe just two reasons. One, it has agent. That's a good starting point. Any unit that you put a big investment into, such as, I, I think that five power is a big investment. I think that four power is the most amount of power you can put into something without guaranteeing that the unit sticks around for a card to be playable. And we're, the bar is really high. We're talking about Sandstorm, Titan, and Vara, and that's basic. So Throne Warden has Aegis, and I think that's a big reason, part of why it is played is because it can stick around pretty well. The other reason is because it has an immediate effect. You look at expensive cards that people play, such as Rezon or Heart of the Vault or Black Sky Harbinger. They all have an immediate effect, and I think that's huge. Even though the immediate effect of Throne Warden is just that you get four armor, that is, I think, significant enough that it doesn't have to stick around for too long, that it that it's worth the invest. Five power is a lot. Your card needs to do do something really special in order to be played at a cost of five. Rost, while it is a large threat and it sticks around, it's resilient to removal, it doesn't do a whole ton immediately when it enters the field. It doesn't remove anything else. It doesn't gain you life if you're being swarmed by an aggressive start from Skycrag aggro, and your opponent can harsh rule it along with any other units that might be on the board when it becomes their turn. Now you may say, of course, you're happy to get your Rust harsh ruled because it just comes back shifted. And while that's true, the pace of the game is pretty fast. The power level of our constructed format is really high, and having those few turns off where it doesn't do anything, it's just waiting around and shift, your opponent can really pull ahead, whether that be via a site, or just playing something like Brilliant Idea, or even just playing a unit and attacking with it, they'll have the opportunity to do that while Rost is shifted. And then when Rost comes back, it has the same issue. It still doesn't have protection for itself, and it only attacks in block. Let's look at two of the big comparisons that you can make for Rost. There's Mokto, which shares its resilience to removal, and World Bear, which is also roughly the same size, and though while Rost gains value from being removed, World Bear Behemoth gains pretty immediate value once you start attacking. If you get two attacks in with World Bear Behemoth, you've generated a lot. Neither of these cards see a ton of play. Sure, they see fringe play once in a while, but I, I, don't, I can't remember the last time that either of these cards were really around the meta. I think that Mokto is the really big comparison. Sure, Rost comes in, or rather, Rost comes back sooner after you kill it, but even so, I don't think that was the problem that Mokto had. I think Mokto just didn't do enough, and then if someone needed to get rid of it in order to push through lethal damage they could without having to, you know, have two pieces of removal or two things to target it. And as far as immediate impact goes, World Bear Behemoth just wasn't enough of an impact. It was too slow. Yes, it could attack for block, attack and block for a ton, but the value it generated took like two turns to get going and get enough power into play. And Rost doesn't even have that. I mean, you don't get additional value by attacking with Rost. Your value is their life total dropping by seven. It doesn't even have an endurance, so it can't block. So I think that it's lack 
lack of an immediate effect, and the fact that it just attacks and blocks, and I guess that it doesn't have Aegis and is really difficult to play, all means that I didn't think that Rost was really going to see a ton of play. Now let's talk about two cards from the same cycle that I was opt about. So first, there's Saditi, which we've seen the impact of already. We've seen a lot of people attacking, then playing Saditi, then drawing a million cards and winning. And that's not because Saditi is a large Valkyrie or that it's Injustice, which has another a lot of great cards on its own, but just because it has that pseudo summon effect, I guess technically an onslaught effect, that when it enters the field, it doesn't have to attack or stick around, your opponent can harshal, you're still going to get that curse if your opponent doesn't have face ages, and that's going to generate you a lot of value. Maybe it doesn't generate you a value immediately, but it's going to threaten to generate a lot of value. In any case, it generates value the turn that you play it. The other card from the cycle that I was optimistic on, which we haven't seen a ton of, is Godan. Now, Godan being a 5-5 charge without any sort of evasion does give it a disadvantage compared to the other cards in this cycle, but it breaks the rules a little in that it has charge. And if you look at the cards that have charge, yes, they pushed it a little in this set with Eclipse Dragon and Godan, but we haven't seen a ton of great cards with charge in Eternal. We had Soulfire Dragon, and I suppose we have Champion of Fury and Vicious Highwayman, and I guess Bandit. All of those units only have two health, and their stats are pretty underwhelming. Like, it's easy to block them, unless, of course, Vicious Highwayman has Quick Draw. I guess, I guess Bandit Queen also has Quick Draw, but it doesn't always have Quick Draw. Like, it's it's pretty easy to block them. In any case, Godin's big and has charge, and that is something that we haven't seen a ton of in Eternal, because it, it breaks the game a little. Like, if, if you know that your opponent is playing a lot of charge units, then you have to have some sort of defense up against it on their turn. Basically, when you're deciding how you should spend your power on your turn, there's some unknown information in what may be attacking from your opponents if they play a charge you first. I guess a good example of it is this. If you're playing against a deck that doesn't have charge, you can always determine what your opponent is going to be attacking you with, you with on their turn. Like, if you see a Sandstorm Titan and a World Bear Behemoth, you know that those are attacking you on this turn. However, once you introduce cards with charge to the equation, such as Cyclist or Amaran Stinger, then you have to figure out your line of play without, or rather, with some uncertainty as to what your opponent's going to do. If you leave that power up for Equivocate, for example, thinking that your opponent's going to attack you with a lethal Cyclist, they, they can also respond to that by playing something else. So it's this weird information war that you're playing when you think your opponent has cards with charge, but you're still forced to play in a certain way that respects that, and then your opponent gets to respond to how you play that by sequencing their cards and not running into some sort of removal spell that they don't want to run into. While people usually think of the decks that play a lot of charge units as being kind of mindless, as in playing their units and just bashing, I think there's some interesting intricacy that comes in when you're talking about a card with charge that lets the person with the charge units play in such a way that they can dodge certain removal spells or blank power that the opponent is holding. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. My point here is that Saditi has an immediate effect. Godan kind of has an immediate effect in charge, but both of those cards break the break the rules of the game in ways that we haven't seen a ton of, or at least introduce a new element to the game that we don't see a ton of, whereas I feel like Rost is just kind of a mashup of Makto and World Bear, two units that don't see a ton of play. So that's why I didn't expect it to see a ton of play, and I, I don't expect it to do particularly well in tournaments going forward. All right, thank you so much for listening to this solo cast of FE cast. I promise we'll have more guests on soon. What's coming up is this weekend, of course, we have Ranked Masters, the showdown for one of the two final spots in Worlds. I will be competing if you're competing. Again, good luck. And also the Friends of Eternal Twitch channel will hopefully continue to grow and develop as we go on in this week. So be sure to tune in to that throw it a follow, and hopefully I'll see you there. Thanks again so much for listening. It's a pleasure to make FE cast every week and discuss these issues with you. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to tweet at me on Twitter, at Sunnyvale, or message me on Discord. Happy to discuss these topics with you. And if not, thanks once again for listening, and until next time, we will see you in the friend zone. Friends of Eternal is an inclusive community-based team dedicated to self-improvement and helping others do the same. We accept all newcomers to our ranks, so if the team environment appeals to you, or if you just think we're cool and want to hang out with us, we're happy to have you. All you have to do is go to my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash sunnyvale, and type in exclamation point fe, and there you will find more information on how to join the Discord and be a fully-fledged member of the team. 
Thanks again so much for listening, and until next time, we will see you in the friend zone.